What is up, Livewire Church? Good to see you guys this morning. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. Thank you so much for being with us. If you're a guest this morning, again, we want to welcome you here. Just sit back, relax. We're, we're not going to ask you to, uh, to give us your money. We're not going to ask you to tell us your checking account number and all of that. And we're not going to put you on the spot or anything. We're just thankful that you're here and just kind of uh, hanging out with us, and we want to be able to answer any questions that you may have about the church afterwards. But again, thank you so much for hanging out with us. Uh, we've been on this series, Run for Your Life. Now, we haven't been looking at this series and, and kind of what comes to mind a lot of times when we hear that phrase or we hear somebody running for their life. A lot of times we think about somebody that's running from something. They're totally afraid. Something is trying to get them. You know, you ever have one of those dreams, right? One of those nightmares where somebody's chasing you. Anybody? Am I the only one? I mean, come on. And you had those dreams where somebody's just chasing you or some monster's chasing you or whatever it might be, and you are just taking off. You are running for your life. You're just trying to get out of Dodge. Get me out of here. I need to, I need to, get, I need to get saved. I need help. I need somebody to, to rescue me. But we, we're not talking about that so much about running for your life. We're actually talking about as we kick off this new year, and, and can you, I mean, do you know that we're already in the third week of January? I mean, isn't that crazy? We just, it was just January 1st, wasn't it? Didn't we just see the ball drop or the orange drop and say Happy New Year? I mean, here we are three weeks in. And folks, here's the thing. Here's what we've been talking about, running for our lives. We've been talking about in this year, what if we ran after life like we never have before? And one of the things that we've discovered is in running after life like we never have before, actually, life is a person. And life is the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I came to give life and that to the fullest, abundantly. I want to bring life into you. God is the one that created life. And so when we say we're running after life, we're actually running after a person. We're actually running after the one who can give life, the one who created life, and the one who has life for us. We sang the song, Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me. But then we also sing that last part where it says, he is for me. Did you know that God is for you, that Jesus is for you, that yes, God has the very best in store for every single one of us? And that's what we've been looking at. We've been saying, okay, well, what does it mean to run after life? What does it mean to run after it? Because here's the thing, friends, you know this as well as I do. Whether, whether we chase after life or not, life's going to happen. And life will just pass us by if we're just going to, you know, kind of sit around and just let life do what it wants to do and, and treat us the way it wants to treat us and throw at us what it wants to throw at us. We can just let life just pass us by, but life is going to happen. And my encouragement over these last, uh, last several weeks and, and my encouragement this morning continues is that I pray and, and my challenge for every single one of us is that instead of sitting back and just letting life happen, or instead of just coasting, instead of just kind of just going along with the flow, what if we ran for life? Here's what I believe. I believe this with all my heart, and I encourage you, if you've missed any of these messages, or even if you've been here, I encourage you to go to our website, wiredalive.com slash media. You can catch the messages, re-hear them, re-listen to them. Here's what I believe with all my heart. I believe that this, this series, this, this idea of running after life, this idea of tra chasing, after God, chasing after God can set up our year for success can set up our very year to where we're not looking back and we're just, we're back into the same state that we were last year or, or you know, it's not much different and, and not much has changed or whatever it might be. I believe that this year can be different and I believe that this year can be our very best year yet if we'll chase after God. And that's what we've been talking about. Now, some of the things, just a quick recap, uh, one of the things that we've been talking about is a, is a confidence. Before we can even start running, we must have a confidence of winning. And Christ is that confidence. That, that any athlete, any, any team that steps on the field, any, any MMA fighter that steps into the, into the octagon, they're going in with a confidence that they're going to win. They've practiced, they've trained, they're going in with the idea that, hey, I'm going to win. And it's the same that goes for us. We've got to be confident. We've got to be confident of winning this race of life. We've got to be confident that as we run, we're going to win. We're going to win the prize. We're going to get the, get the thing that we're striving for. We're going to go for gold, and we're going to get that gold. And the other thing is this. Last week, we looked at the past, and we said this. If you're not careful, your past will hijack your present, 
and contaminate your future. See, the past doesn't, there's not much merit to looking back at the past. I mean, it could be past regrets that we all have. It could be past successes. That is, that's great. But what happens is we look back to the glory days and we forget, wait, you know, I've got a life to live now. I've got a future ahead of me right now. So even the past successes, while they're great, still there's not a whole lot of merit to looking back to those past regrets, the past successes, past experiences. We talked about past hurts, huge hurts that maybe we have that Honestly, we have to move past those things. We've got to get the help that we need and, and move past those things or else they're going to grip us. They're going to take hold of us. And again, it's going to hijack our present and contaminate our future. Or maybe we'll look back to when things were, when things were fun. And we remember those days. We remember when sin was fun. I mean, yeah, it was a lot of fun. But then remember the consequences of that, of that sin? So when we have that confidence and, and we're not looking back at the past, just like an athlete, just like a, a runner, you know, he's not worried about the competition. He's just, going for the, he's just going for the finish line. He's going for gold. He's not worried about who's on the side of him. He's not worried about the course. He's not worried about the spectators. He's taking off and he's running. What if we did that with life? What if we had that confidence? What if we didn't look back and we just ran? So we want to close this series up this morning with just running and going for gold. Paul said this in, in Philippians, coming back to uh, this verse again. Brothers and sisters, Philippians 3, 13 and 14, our theme uh, verse of the series. He says, brothers and sisters, I can't consider myself a winner yet. He says, I haven't won yet, but this is what I do. I don't look back, which we talked about last week. I don't look back. I'm lengthening my stride. I'm running straight toward the goal to win the prize that God's heavenly call offers in Christ Jesus. Paul says, I haven't won yet, but here's what I'm doing. I'm running. I'm going to take off and I'm running. Now, if you do any type of exercise at all, which every one of us should do, um, if we do any type of exercise, and more specifically, if you do any type of cardio exercise, some people will, their cardio exercise may be walking, you know, they'll do, they'll, they'll, they'll walk maybe around their neighborhood, or they'll walk a mile, or whatever it might be, or some people may do, like, the fast walk, you know, uh, some people do the jog, you know, which doesn't make, never makes sense to me, um, and then you got people that just look funny, and they do the power walk, you know, do that, you know, and you got the, the power wall. And then there's just some people that they just run, and they're going for miles. Some people get their cardio, and they're just, they, they are gone, man. And they're, they're just taking one long stride after another. I mean, they just, just extend it. And this is what Paul was saying. Paul said this. Paul said, I'm not, I'm not just, just going to walk through life. Paul said, I'm not going to, look how cute I look. I'm not just going to jog through life. Paul said, man, I'm lengthening my stride. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take, take as much ground as I can. I'm going to get my legs spread out. Better watch out. I don't split my pants. I'm going to take a long stride, and I'm going to run. Paul said, I'm running. I'm running. He said, I'm not a winner yet, but you know what I'm doing? I'm going to lengthen my stride, and I'm going to run. My challenge for us this morning and as we take on this year and as we take on each day let's not even let's not even so much look at the whole entire year but if what if we just ran each day what if we got up every morning we said i'm gonna lengthen my stride today i'm gonna run today and then the following day we did the same i'm gonna chase after god no matter what uh, life tries to throw at me, no matter uh, what the devil is trying to bring into my life, no matter how much I'm getting hit, knocked back, whatever it might be, no matter what, I'm going to chase after God. I'm determined to chase after God. See, now Paul is using this analogy, and he actually uses it uh, with the, uh, the letter that he wrote to the Corinthians, which it was definitely not only relevant at this time, um, but it was definitely relevant for the Corinthians. He uses this idea of the foot races, and actually, Paul talks about boxing. He talks about wrestling. And, and it's funny because if you've, if you've read his letters before, most of the New Testament, Paul, Paul writes, and we call them books, but they're actually letters. But if you read his letters before, and maybe you didn't pick up on it, but when you see him talking about boxing, you see him talking about wrestling or running, he's talking about the games. He's talking about what we know as the Olympic Games, which uh, back in that time, Corinth was actually, that city, they hosted what was called the Isthmian Games, which was second in prestige to the Olympic Games. 
And so this was something that they would connect to. I mean, it's, it's just like for us. I mean, we go to sporting events, and, and we love to see, we love to go to football games or baseball games or basketball games. And, and the same thing was true for them. They love the games. They loved going to the games. And what was big more, uh, more for them was uh, the Isthmian games or just the games in general. They had the Olympics. They had the Isthmian games, which were very, very similar. They had very similar stuff to what, uh, what we had. They had the discus. They had uh, the long jump. Um, they had uh, chariot racing. Um, they had wrestling. They had boxing. They also had, whether you know this or not, actually poetry and, and uh, uh, singing were actually in the games. Did you know that? In the Isthmian games, or back in ancient times, back in uh, uh, those times, back in Paul's time where they would have the games, singing and poetry was part of the games. And then, of course, foot races. They had the foot races. And so this would relate to the Corinthian church or, or the, the city of, of Corinth, the people, the Christians there, when Paul said, run to win the prize, run the Christian life, just like that athlete is running to get to the end of the line and he's going for gold and he's going for the prize. Actually, back in those times, they didn't have the bronze, the silver, or the gold. It was just a prize. So the first person to the end, the first person to win, the, the person that does it the best, they were the one that got the prize. So Paul tells the Corinthians, he says, you guys run this Christian faith and run it to win the prize. Just like that athlete is, is in that foot race and he's taking off and he's got the strides and he's, he's lengthening that stride because he wants to take up as much ground as he can. He wants to get to that finish line. He said, run, run like you never have before. Chase after it. Run this Christian life just like you were running a race to get the prize, Paul said. Now, actually, uh, the writer of Hebrews, which a, a lot of scholars do believe that Paul was the one that wrote Hebrews, uh, but we're not, a, we're not 100% on that. But the writer of Hebrews actually describes, goes into this a little bit more detail uh, about the games and, and about running and, and about the, the Olympics or the Isthmian games. And, and he says this, you've probably read it before, Hebrews 12, uh, 12 1. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. Now get the idea of this, because just like we would go to a sporting event, they were at the games, they were at the Isthmian games, they were at the Olympics, and they're watching some of their favorite athletes. Can you imagine being one of those athletes on the field? And you've got all, you've got this crowd of hundreds and thousands of people that are just out there in the stands and they're like yeah there goes josh Woohoo! you know win it come on i mean can you imagine like you're the athlete on that and you just you just look around and it's just circling just fans it's just a sea of fans a sea of spectators and this is what the writer of hebrews was saying he says just like there is or or, or since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd we'll come back to that in just a second we're surrounded by such a huge crowd like an athlete that walks on the field i had the opportunity just the incredible opportunity of uh and, and you've probably been to some sporting uh, events before maybe you've seen some of your teams or um, and I had, years back, I had the opportunity of seeing my Giants, still the best team in the NFL. You can say what you want. They're the best team in the NFL. But I got to see my Giants uh, play in Miami. And uh, so here I am. You know, I'm not ashamed. I'm putting on my Giants jersey. I got my Giants ball cap on. I don't care what Miami fans are over there. I'm in the stands, and I'm cheering, I'm, and I'm yelling, and I'm screaming, yeah, Giants! You know, Miami fans all over me, hating on me and all of that. But we won that day, you know, because of all the boosts of energy that I just sent down there to all of my players. But I got the chance to watch the Giants. And, and if you've ever been to a sporting event, you know it gets crazy. And some fans, man, they take it way too serious. But, I mean, they, they are just nuts, and it's just crazy, and it could be loud, especially in, in some, of those, uh, some of those states, some of those cities where they take their football serious. They take their basketball serious. College, have you ever watched college basketball? Especially when you get into the, uh, um, what is it, March Madness? I mean, man, they get crazy in there. You see them, you know, in unison. They're jumping, man, they're... 
They're just cheering on me, and it's rumbling in there, but it's just crazy. I also had the great opportunity of watching Michael Jordan play one of his last games, which was awesome. You know, I was there in Miami and got to see Jordan, uh, Jordan play, which is, I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just, totally, there's something about it that is just totally awesome. And so when we go to a sporting event, they did the same thing back then that we would do. They are cheering on their team. They're cheering on their athlete. And the writer of Hebrews here, he's saying, he's saying, guys, don't you know? He's, he's saying, Christians, don't you know? People of God, Jesus followers, don't you know that we've got a huge crowd of spectators that ran before us that are rooting us on, that are saying, go, man, go for gold. Don't give up. Don't give up. Keep running. Keep fighting the good fight of faith. Don't give up on God. Don't give up on your relationship with him. Don't give up on the Bible. Don't give up on, on what God wants to do in your life. Keep running. See, we have Paul. We have Peter. We have Mary. We've got, we've got the disciples. We've got the rest of the disciples. We've got David, people like David. We've got people like Solomon, like Esther. We've got these men and women that have gone before us that are the spectators, just like in a sporting event. That the writer of Hebrews is saying, hey, just like there's a crowd, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses, people that have gone, Christians, Jesus followers that have gone before us, that are telling us, man, it's worth it. Run after God. It is so worth it. We know we've been there. And they're cheering us on. They're cheering us on. And the number one fan that is cheering us on is Jesus Christ himself. See, Jesus is actually the only human being right now in heaven. And when I say human being, I'm talking about somebody that is in physical form, that has his flesh, a body. Everybody else that, is, that has died, that accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of their life, they went to heaven in spirit form. They're in heaven in spirit form. Jesus is the only human being, the only physical body that right now, which we'll see in just a second, that right now is seated at the right hand of God the Father. And you know what he's doing? He's cheering us on. He's praying for us constantly, and he's cheering us on. You can do it. You got this. Don't let the devil beat you down. Don't let that situation take you out. Don't, don't choose to end your life prematurely. You got this. You can do it, Jesus is saying. So notice this because uh, the writer of Hebrews goes on. He says, we've got this great crowd that's cheering us on. A bunch of people that have gone before us. Jesus Christ himself that has gone before us. And he continues on. And we'll come back or, or start from the beginning here. This is the God's word translation. Since we are surrounded by so many examples of faith, all right, so many people that came before us, we must get rid of everything that slows us down, especially sin that distracts us. Did you notice what, what he's saying there? Not everything that distracts us and not everything that weighs us down is sin. But we got to get rid of it. There are some things or maybe some people in our lives that, yeah, they're not, they're not a bad influence in our life. They're not bad people. They're not maybe really like leading us down a path of sin or, or, or to do something bad. But maybe... Maybe they're taking up too much of our time. Maybe, you know, we have a great friendship with them, but we're just hanging out with them all the time that we don't even have a relationship with God. We're not connecting with God, or, or we're not even taking care of maybe some of our responsibilities of life that are maybe just falling by the wayside or just sliding, sliding off, and, 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 we're just, and we're not getting the things done that we need to get done. And so notice that not everything that weighs us down, not everything that distracts us, is sin-oriented. It could be something that's very good. It could be something that is, that's not bad at all. But notice what the writer says. He says, we must get rid of everything, whatever it is that's weighing us down, whatever it is that is stopping us from taking the long stride that we need, whatever it is that, that is even uh, slowing us down to the extent that, man, we took off running, but we forgot this thing's not a sprint. This life is not a sprint. It's actually a marathon. This life with Christ is, is not a sprint, but that it's a marathon. And if we've got those things weighing us down, you know, we're, we're running, we're taking off. And then before we know it, you know, we're, you know, we're doing the silly jog. And we get tired and we're just kind of like walking. And then we find something to rest on. We just, you know, just resting. 
But he says, man, run, run, and get rid of everything that is weighing you down, especially sin that distracts us, especially the sin which we've talked about the last couple weeks, especially we got to crucify this flesh. We got to make this flesh suffer because it is a trouble maker. He says, we must run the race that lies ahead of us and never give up. I mean, it's so amazing to me how in our culture, in our culture, the first option, whether you have your business venture there, whether you have your career there, whether it's your, your marriage, whether it's your family, whether it's money, whether it's my lifestyle, my health, whatever it is, it's amazing to me how the first option when things come against us or there's a challenge or whatever, the first thing that we think of is giving up. The first thing we think of is throwing in the towel. The first thing we think of is quitting. Oh, well, I didn't know, I didn't know that this is, you know, I didn't know that it was going to take forever to, to build my business up. I, I didn't know I had to do everything when I, when I started my business. I, I didn't know that this is, this is what it was going to I didn't know that, you know, I, I, I thought since we got married, we said I do and I love you. you know, I thought it was just going to be bliss, man, just love and bliss every single day. We were going to wake up and just, oh, honey, oh, I love you so much. And it was just going to be lovey-dovey for the rest of our life. Wake up. That's a romantic fantasy. That's not reality. I thought that that's what's going to, well, since it's not, I'm going to give up. Oh, well, I didn't know that raising kids was going to be that, that hard. I didn't know it was going to be that challenging. Uh, no, you know what? I, I think I might want to give up. Oh, man, I, I, didn't know, I didn't know there were so many foods that were just so good that are also so bad for you and that I can't have them as often as I, I would like. You know, that? I forget it. I, I don't care about eating healthy. I'm just going to give up. Exercise is so hard. It's so hard to get over there and bench press and do sit-ups and run and you know, I'll just jog. I'm just going to give up. It's amazing how quickly we think of quitting, how quickly we think of just giving up instead of pressing through. Again, he says, we must run the race. And more specifically, he's tying it into the games, but he's saying, we must run this race, this Christian life. We must run this race and not give up. Don't give up. Run this race and don't give up. Notice he goes on. He says, we must focus on Jesus, the source and the goal of our faith. Another, an older translation says, the author and the finisher of our faith. Jesus is the one that's authoring, that authored the book of your life and of my life. He's the one that wrote it out. And actually, there's a, a, another translation that says, the author and perfecter of our faith. That he's the one that's going to perfect our lives. See, I, I don't know about you. I, I know myself, and, and I just have to be honest with myself. I know that I'm not perfect. And I know there are some things in my life that can change, that need some tweaking, that need some adjusting, that some things need to get just thrown out completely, need to get cut off, or whatever it might be. And Jesus wants to bring that perfection in our life. He wants to perfect what, is, what needs to be tweaked, what is a little bit off, or what may not be exactly right. He wants to perfect it. He's the one that's authoring He's the one that's written the book on your life, the book of Josh, or the book of your name. And he's written that book, and he's got some amazing things in store for every single one of us. God's got some incredible things in store for our life. See, here's the thing. We often think of, okay, I'm ready to take on 2015. I'm ready to run after the life that, that, I, that I desire for myself. And, and we're thinking getting out of debt, which is cool. We're thinking of losing a couple pounds, which is cool. We're thinking of eating better, which is cool. We're thinking of having a better lifestyle, which is cool. We're thinking of treating our wives or our, our husband better, raising our children, which is all cool, right? It's all good. Here's the thing. Then when Jesus is writing out your book, when he's written out, God's written out your book, it's much bigger than you just living a healthy life. Did you know that? It's much bigger than you just treating your wife right. It's much bigger than that. See, it's much bigger than that to the extent that because you're going to eat right, because you're going to exercise, because you're going to do some of these 
some of these things. It allows you to be around for a long time for your wife. It allows you to be around for a long time for your family. And besides that, it allows you to be around a long time for people that need you, that God wants to use you to touch their lives, that God wants to use you to make a difference in their life. See, a lot of times we're thinking about the big world and how can we make a difference in in the world? And that's great. That's awesome. But a lot of times we miss the opportunities of just making an impact in somebody's world. Right where we are and in their world. How can I impact their world? But you know what? If I don't drop the pounds, if I don't, if I don't exercise, if I don't take care of myself, I'm not going to be around to impact the lives that God wanted me to impact. See, it's much bigger than losing weight. It's much bigger than just getting out of debt. See, if I get out of debt, it's much bigger than that. It gives me the opportunity to be generous with people that are in need, people that are hurting, people that are suffering, that I can say, hey, you know what? I'm out of debt, and and I've got this extra here. I want to give it to you. I want to bless you with this. I want to buy this for you. It's much bigger. It far exceeds what we could ever dream or imagine what God wants to do in our life. He's written it down in his book, and he wants to bring it about in your life and in my life. He wants to bring it about in our lives. Jesus is the source and the goal. He's the author and the finisher. He's the author and the perfecter of our faith. Now look at this, okay? Because Jesus is our number one fan, and he's one of those that have gone before us. Notice this. He saw the joy ahead of him, so he endured death on the cross and ignored the disgrace it brought him. Where is the joy in that? Where is the joy in that? It's like you read that that first part of the sentence there, and you're like, he saw the joy ahead of him. You're like, man, what did Jesus see? Man, it must have been awesome. What did he see? Oh, well, he saw that he'd have to suffer. He saw that he would have to be beaten to a pulp beyond recognition. He saw that he would have to be nailed to a cross. He saw that he would have to be nailed and suffer on that cross and and that he would eventually have to die on that cross. But you know what he saw beyond that and this is what brought him joy? He saw every single one of you sitting here today. He saw every single person that is living today. And he saw every single person that salvation was made available, that sins would be forgiven. He saw healing that that people would experience in their body. He saw addictions that people would be delivered from. Jesus looked out and he said, yes, I see that I'm going to have to suffer. Yes, I see that I'm going to have to be punished. And I see that I'm going to have to be nailed to a cross. But you know what I see more importantly than that? You know what I see beyond? Beyond that, I see people that are going to have the opportunity to have their sins forgiven. I see people that are going to have the opportunity to have the very best life that they can live. I see people that are going to have the opportunity to have eternal life instead of eternal damnation, to spend eternity with God. I see people, Jesus said. I see people that are going to be healed, Jesus said. I see people that are going to be delivered, that are going to be set free. That's what I see. Why did Jesus have joy knowing exactly what he was going to have to experience? He had joy because he saw you. He saw me. He saw everybody before us. And he said, I know what this means. And here's the thing, friends. We get a little bump. We get a little hit. We get a little jab. And so often we want to give up. Let me ask you something. Let me ask you something. What if Jesus gave up? What if Jesus said, you know, I I see it, but that ain't worth losing my life for. I, I, I see it, but I'm not going through all that punishment that actually mankind deserves. I don't even deserve it. He didn't. He lived a perfect life. That's why he was able to be the perfect sacrifice for us. He didn't have to die on that cross. He didn't have any sin of his own. What if Jesus would have given up? And I think it's something that we should remind ourselves every single day when we want to give up, when we want to throw in the towel. Let's look at Jesus, our greatest fan, and the one who went before us, and the one who did the most for us. Let's say, wait, no, I can't give up on my marriage. I can't give up on my children. I can't give up 
on this business I started. I can't give up on my career. I can't give up on, on this lifestyle. I can't give up. I can't give up on serving God. I can't give up on, on waking up each morning earlier or going before I go to bed, getting into the word of God. I can't give up. I can't give up because Jesus didn't give up on me. Jesus still was beaten and punished and bruised beyond recognition for me. And then he went to a cross for me. How can I give up? No, instead, the writer of Hebrews says, run, man, run like you are going for gold. Run for it. Run to win the prize. He saw the joy ahead of him, so he endured the cross, death on the cross, and ignored the disgrace it brought him. Then he received the highest position in heaven, the one next to the throne of God. He sits at the right hand of the Father because of what he did. Paul actually says this. He says it about us. He says, if we'll humble humble ourselves, God will exalt us. God will lift us up. Kind of looking at Jesus, and, and when we honor God with our lives, God says, man, I'm ready. I'm ready to lift you up. I'm ready to bless you. I'm ready to bring some good stuff in your life. So now here's the thing that I, that I, that I think of as we close out this series. So we bring it to a close. We're talking about running, finishing off running. We've got our confidence. We're not looking back, and we're running. We're taking off running. Well, what does it mean to lengthen our stride? What does it mean to run? See, you see, I believe that it means to go after God with all of our heart and, and, and not give up and not let up, but just to go after God, to chase after him, to not be ashamed and, and, to, not, and, and to be undeterred and, 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 and to just, just go after it. So the, one of the things that I think of is, you know, what, what does that even entail? Like when we're, we're, we're thinking about running and, and we're taking off and we're going we're gonna to run this thing, we're going to run the Christian life that we have a very real, a very vivid awesome illustration about the Olympic Games and and just what they did and the fans and all of those that as we think about we've got people that have gone before us Christians they're cheering us on and we're running this thing Jesus our number one fan he's cheering us on but what does it actually look like or what does it entail and I think one of the things that it entails is putting first things first we've got to put first things first what does that mean well Jesus said this Matthew records one of his disciples records this but first Be concerned about his kingdom and what has his approval, then all these things will be provided to you. And actually, Jesus was talking to the people, and he was saying, you know, you you guys are worrying about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. You're worrying about these, these, the necessities of life. And I get it, Jesus is saying, I know you need them. But he said, rather than running after all of that stuff, rather than trying to seek after all of those things, because here's the thing, the word concern or be concerned is the word seek. And here's the thing, friends, you and I, we're going to seek something or someone primarily in our life. We're going to do it. Whether we realize it or not, there is something or someone that we are primarily seeking. And Jesus is saying, none of those things, whatever it is, or none of those other people are going to bring you the life that you really desire or bring you the life that I can give you. None of those things are going to fulfill your life. There is nobody on this earth. I don't care if it's your husband, it's your wife, family member, a really good BFF. Nobody can bring the fulfillment in your life like God can. And so Jesus says, be but first. Or he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness or what has his approval. Then all this stuff that you're kind of worried about, God's going to take care of it. Now, interesting thing about this is, Actually, David wrote something kind of similar. And you remember me saying, I think it was the first week that uh, we started off the, the series, we were talking about desires, and we were talking about how we've got to crucify the flesh and its passions and its, its desires, and we've got to get rid of those bad desires and, and all of those things. But then we also said how even, even our good desires, that we kind of got to put them on the shelf, or we got to kind of lay them aside, or we got to kind of give them to God. Because even in our good desires, even though they're good, a lot of times we want them in the time when we can't really handle them or, or when we're not even ready for them. And so if we'll lay them aside, if we'll give them to God, God will give it to us at the right time. Notice this. So David writes this in Psalms, and he says, very similar to what Jesus, but uh, something else as well. Psalm 37, 4 and 5, he says, be happy with the, with the Lord or delight yourself in the Lord. And he will give you the desires of your heart. 
Entrust your ways to the Lord. Trust him, and he will act on your behalf. So David says, hey, if you'll delight yourself in the Lord, if you'll be happy with God, if you'll trust that God really has your best interest in mind, guess what? He's going to give you the desires of your heart. So some of those things that we lay aside momentarily, God wants to bring those in our lives. But here's the other thing about that, is there are some good desires that we have, good desires that we have, that, yeah, God can fulfill them in, in our life, but here's what happens is we, we start delighting ourselves in God or we start just kind of walking with God and, and just, just having our, building our relationship with God. And then maybe some of those good desires that we had, maybe we realize, wow, you know what? I mean, it, it would be cool to have that, but, you know, that really, I mean, that really doesn't matter. I mean, it really, it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things, you know, to have that, have that thing or to have that going on in, in my life. When we delight ourselves in God, we'll realize that there are some things, even some good desires, that they just don't even really matter. And, and we'll get to that place where we're just like, well, you know, if God gives it to me, okay. But if not, I mean, that's cool too. I mean, I, don't, I actually don't even really, I don't care about it anymore. You know, we start to see with the eyes of God, and we start to see the things that really do matter, like people's lives. You know, people on this earth, and, 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 and that mattering, and, and also their eternal destination, and that mattering. We start getting a bigger picture, a greater picture, a better picture. But here's the thing, is God wants to give you the desires of your heart. Absolutely. But God says, delight yourself in me. Fall in love with me. Build your relationship with me. And watch what I could do with your life. Watch what I've written about your life. It is so amazing. It's going to blow your socks off. I'm going to do some incredible things in your life, God's saying. Watch me give you the desires of your heart. And then the, the question is that we have to ask ourselves is, can we trust God to give us the desires of our heart? Can we trust him to give us the desires of our heart? And can we rely, that, rely on him to know, to know when we actually need it, when the right timing is? Like some of us right now, come on, let's be honest. Some of us right now, we want to be married, but right now we're not ready to be married. Like we're just a little too selfish. <laughs> Try to bring somebody into that and you'll be, divor you'll be divorced in a week. You we don't want to do that. Like some of us right now, we're married and, and we want to have children, but we may not be ready for children. Get a dog first. <laughs> we might not be ready. So can we trust God? Because those are awesome desires. Does God want you to be blessed financially? Absolutely. Does God want you to prosper and succeed? Absolutely. But God doesn't want you to prosper and succeed to the extent that if he gave you that prosperity and that success, that you'll forget about him because you're so caught up in the prosperity and the success. See, so he'll bring it in the right time. Can we trust him to do that? Can we trust that he'll bring it to us in the right time? Because the first thing, if we're saying, man, I'm going to run, I'm going to run after life, I'm going to chase after God, then what that looks like, it first looks like putting first things first, putting him first in our life. Another thing that it looks like is disciplinary action. What does that mean? What do you mean by that, Josh? Well, Paul writes this. He says in uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 27, and here's where he's talking about boxing, talking about the games again. He says, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that my preaching or that after preaching that, uh, to others, I myself might be disqualified. My life would be disqualified because people would see, man, this guy's really not a Christian. So here's what Paul says. He says, I discipline my body. Going back to that crucifying of our flesh, you know, our flesh suffering because it's just going to get us in trouble. It's got bad desires and it's just going to get us in trouble. But here's the thing that you miss, that you and I miss when we just read this and we don't actually kind of look it up. We don't actually dissect it a little bit. The word discipline that Paul's using here, he's saying, he's, he's actually using some very strong language. He's saying, man, I actually beat my body until it's black and blue. Now, a lot of people, even back in Paul's time and after, afterwards, um, a lot of uh, people started taking it literal. And so they thought, you know, oh, I got to beat myself. You know, I got I to show God, God, look, I'm suffering, I'm suffering. But that's not what Paul meant. 
But here's what Paul was saying. Paul was saying, listen, you've got to stay on top of this body because it's a troublemaker. You've got to stay on top of this flesh. Paul said, I beat it till it's black and blue. And then when he's talking about the training, he's saying, uh, and he says, I beat my body until it's black and blue, and I beat it into submission and training. I make it my slave. He said, I am beating it, and I am making it my slave. I'm not allowing this flesh to run my life. I'm not allowing this flesh with, it, with its bad desires, its corrupt desires, its evil desires to lead me down a path that's, just go, that's only going to end in destruction for me. Paul said, I'm not doing it. I'm going to beat this thing up. So he's like, you know, in, in, in reality, he's, he's kind of saying, you know, I'm, I'm doing one of these numbers, you know. Instead of fighting somebody else like in the games or watching a boxing event or watching an MMA fight, Paul said, I'm, I'm socking myself. I'm taking it to the gut. You know, I'm taking it to the face. He said, I'm beating myself until I'm black and blue because I'm going to train this body. I'm going to make sure this body knows that this flesh knows you're my slave. I'm not your slave. Jesus took care of that on the cross. You're my slave. So if we're going to lengthen that stride and we're going to run and we're going to keep running and not give up, it's going to take some discipline. It's going to take some disciplinary action in our lives. It's going to take getting rid of some of the things that, again, our body so desperately want. But if we'll look at it, if we'll identify it, we'll see the end result of, of going along with that desire, or just going along with our flesh. So it's going to take some disciplinary action. And then the other thing is it's going to take is being able to take a hit. And here, here this go, goes back to, again, what we said earlier, where we're just so... Um, it's just so easy for us as a culture to just give up, to just quit, just to throw in the towel. We got to be able to take a hit. If we're going to run, if we're going to run after God, there's going to be some hits that are coming from the side. There are going to be some jabs. There are going to be some, just some little hits, and then there's going to be some big ones. Have you ever had, have you had a big hit in your life? Maybe a bunch of small ones, maybe some big ones. Every single one of us have been hit before. And we've got to be able to take a hit if we're going to run this Christian faith, if we're going to run this life that God has for us, the life that he's written out for us. What does that mean? Well, the writer of Hebrews again writes, he says, you need endurance. He says, you've got to be able to take a hit and keep going. Remember what Rocky says? I mean, I guess it would be Rocky Six, but Rocky Balboa. When you get knocked down, you've got to be able to take a hit, but keep moving forward. You take that hit, but you keep moving forward, he said. And this is what the writer of Hebrews is saying. He's saying you need a little endurance so that after you have done what God wants you to do, you can receive what he's promised. Don't grow weary, Paul told the Galatians. He said, don't grow weary in well-doing because in due season, you're going to reap a harvest. In due season, you've got a blessing. There's a blessing right around the corner. Don't give up on your marriage. Don't give up on your children. Don't give up on that career. Don't give up on chasing after God. Don't give up on, on getting into, into his word. Don't give up on developing that relationship with him. Don't give up because in due season, the promise that God has for you, the things that he's written out, in your book, he's going to bring it about in your life. But the reality is this, friends, we've got to be able to take a hit. We can't take the hit and say, well, I didn't know that, you know, this is what being a Christian was going to be like. Mm, this is so stupid. This is dumb. I don't want to do this anymore. You know, we can't do it. Let's build some resolve. Let's get a little backbone. Let's, get, let's stand up straight. Let's get our shoulders up. Let's look forward and let's tackle each and every day with the challenges that it brings to us, with the situations and the circumstances, knowing that we're not relying, like we said back in week one, we're not relying on our own strength. We're relying on the strength of Almighty God. Like Hannah said earlier, we're, re we're relying on His almighty power working through us, His mighty strength. He is so much greater, so much bigger, so much more powerful than us, and, and put every human being together, put every organization together. Your God and my God is so much better bigger and so much awesomer and will be in our lives yeah i know it's not a word <laughs> he will be in our lives he'll show himself faithful so we got to be willing to take the hit 
take the hit. Now, Paul said this. Let's close with this. Here's Paul. He's at the end of his life, right? And Paul, he's already, he's been writing letter after letter. Run, toughen that body, discipline it, train, all this. Here's Paul, one of his very, some of his very last words. He writes this to his protege named Timothy, right? A young guy just starting out in the ministry and all that. He writes this. Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have completed the race. I have kept the faith. Paul said, yeah, man, I, took, I got some jabs. And you know what? If there was anybody that suffered more or, or, or just right next to Jesus there or, or was second, it would have been Paul. I mean, you, if you've never read the life of Paul, read the book of Acts, and you see the things that Paul went through. And here's Paul at the end of his life, and he's saying, Timothy, I want you to know something. I got in that ring, and I fought the good fight. He said, Timothy, man, I got punches. I was getting jabs, but I fought the good fight. I completed the race. I decided to lengthen my stride. Remember, remember when I told the Corinthians that? Remember, Timothy, when I, when I wrote that letter to the Philippians to run, to lengthen, lengthen your stride? That's what I'm doing. Paul said, I, I haven't won yet, but I'm, I'm running the race. Now he gets to the end of his life, and he says, I've completed the race, Timothy. I've kept the faith. He says, the prize that shows I have God's approval is now waiting for me. The Lord who is a fair judge, the Lord who is a fair judge will give me the prize on that day. He will give it not only to me, but also to everyone who's eagerly waiting for him to come again. Paul said, every single person that's waiting for Jesus' return, every single person that's eagerly waiting he says they're getting the same prize. What was Paul talking about at this point? Well, he had already lived his full life. Now the prize that he was talking, he was referring to is stepping into eternal life. Stepping into life where there is no more pain, no more suffering, no more wrestling with this flesh. Paul said, now the prize, I'm getting ready to receive that. He said, and that's for every single person. What does it mean to eagerly wait it's like waiting for that family member that's coming home for a visit, and you're getting the house ready. You don't just sit there. You get the house ready. You're getting everything ready. Well, to eagerly wait for Jesus' return, you know what that looks like? It looks like fighting the good fight. It looks like running the race. It looks like keeping the faith. See, if he just used the word waiting, then it would just be okay. But he said eagerly waiting. That means I'm doing something to prepare for Jesus' return. And he's saying, I'm fighting. Fight the good fight. So I encourage us. Man, let's not. There are people that have already given up on their New Year's resolutions or, or goals or whatever. And, and this year is going to look a lot like last year. And friends, I want to encourage us to be different. I want to encourage us to have that confidence that is in Christ. To not look back but just to run and not give up. And so the question that I want to close with is how will I take off running this year? How will I take off running each day? How am I just going to take off running after God? 